<clears throat> Good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And this is another series of civic forums prior to another town meeting day, which this year will be March 1st. And as always, I encourage you to vote, not on town meeting day per se, but return the ballot before town meeting day or vote on town meeting day. But it's really important that you weigh in, uh, not only on city, but on schools, on cemetery commission, on the Parks Commission, on the Public Safety Authority, on the budgets, and on the capital budget. And tonight, I've got a very special one because I have people who don't necessarily have to be here. They're running unopposed. <laughs> they are our incumbents from District 2, my district, Connor. Well, thanks very much for having us, Richard. Uh, it's, a, it's a great service you do to the community having these discussions. And I, I know... Uh, both Don and myself are happy to be here, and we want to, even if we're unopposed, we want to earn those votes. So, And of course, you introduced her. This is Donna from <laughs> District 1. I was supposed to do that. You preempted me. Uh, sorry. Donna, it's thank a, you. Connor, a, thank you. It's great to be here. It's always good to talk about this. Okay, Donna, you're the senior member. How long on council? Oh, eight years. Eight long years. Four terms, yep. Making the big bucks. <laughs> yes, making the big bucks. <laughs> Connor, how many years on council making the big bucks? I'd be hopefully going into the third term here, so I've got four under the belt. What keeps you guys on, other than to beat Jim Sheridan's record for longevity? For me, it's the commitment of seeing movement on a lot of projects I had seen stall and stall, and that particularly with this council and this mayor, there's a lot of advancement. We have real set goals. We have the desire and the action to use the plans we have to go to the community's vision of being sustainable, of being an advance in our social services and our social justice. And that it evolves around simple things like housing. <laughs> Connor, what do you see? Yeah, I've worked in politics most of my career, <laughs> I have to say, but so it's a, it's a bit unusual for me to step into the role of an elected official. I've never hated a candidate more than myself, I'll tell you that. It's a, <laughs> I, I get very anxious on the campaign trail. But, but now that I've settled in the last four years, it's like Donna said, it's, you can actually see some tangible progress. It's one thing seeing something on paper, but then you mm -hmm. see like, you know, you see, the, you see the trucks come out and see it being built and see progress made. And there's something very addicting to that, I think. Yeah. Um, but also, it's just a, it's such a special community we have, you know. And, and I love the idea that, you know, council, we don't have our own staff per se individually, right. you know. So if you go buy arugula at the grocery store, you're going to get into a chat with somebody about Confluence Park <laughs> or something else going on. So it's a great dialogue back and forth with the constituents. And uh, it's a community that does have a lot of opinions <laughs> and I'm very happy to share them. Yes. Uh, let's walk through some projects. See, I thought you guys were going to make the announcement on my show that something was going to happen on Sabin's Pasture. Uh, <laughs> as, as I told <laughs> Ann the other day in the session that the mayor did, she's running again. Uh, that my son um, was in second or third grade uh, when we voted on the $800,000 bond in Savings Pasture. And my son is getting out of graduate school this year. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with Savings Pasture? It stalled. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because when people say they're so surprised about us interested in perching land, years, I mean, your son is how old? I mean, 28 now. 28, okay. <laughs> so at least 20 plus years, we've been trying to buy a large amount of land in the city limits mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to expand the city options. And people are surprised when something comes on the market and the buyer is interested in selling to the city versus the highest bidder. Of course we are interested. It's a long-term interest we've had. So I feel like we were ready for it. We planned, we considered Absolutely. it. We've got, Constantly, the community says, more housing, more housing, more recreation. I mean, recreation is right there high in people's uh, desire. We, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think we, we've had discussions in council. You know, we're, we're a community of 8,000. We've got a plan to be a community of 10, 11,000 into the future. We have to be forward thinking because uh, what we have right now isn't sustainable. Less than 100 homes sell in Montpelier a year. The average cost of rent is $1,600 a month. Who can afford that? And the only option is to increase the stock, you know, uh, and do, do, do some developing. And I think some people are uncomfortable with that. You know, you, you move to a town in Vermont 
And, and I get this. I, I, I'm guilty of it myself, you know. You, you, you think of being in a Norman Rockwell painting or something, <laughs> having a milkshake with the Never policeman on the changes. counter. <laughs> Everything always changes. It's always in the same spot. And that's just not realistic for a capital city that swells up to like 2,400, uh, 24,000. Used to before COVID. <laughs> But, uh, or it did, yeah. But uh, so we need to be forward thinking. And for the, I think we're both talking about the Elks Club land here at this point. In my mind, it's a question of define or be defined. You know, uh, we can wait. But if we wait, somebody else is going to get that land and we have much less say over it. It's what did we learn from 20 years of Sabin's pastures sitting unsold uh, and undeveloped? What, what are the lessons that we walk away with from? 20 years of, of that well, that's in terms a, of zoning, well, in terms of what, what well, is, what I is. guess one of my lessons as I hear people being so surprised that the city would act on a large plot of land for housing and recreation is that people move in and out. You and I have been here all this time, but a lot of people haven't. Mm. It's a brand new thing to them. And even though we started discussing this what, as early as July, I think I saw, people seemed to be surprised that it was going to be on the ballot in March. And I think, wow. And so I have to realize for other people, Saban's pasture doesn't even exist. They weren't part of that mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I felt like what we learned was we had a lot of discussions, we had a lot of community input, but push comes to shove, the owner controlled. And it wasn't enticing enough for the owner. Did restrictive zoning play a role in that? Initial well, changed restrictive, a lot of that. Initial yeah, yeah. restrictive yeah. zoning. But, uh, it, it, anything can be a barrier if you have hesitation. So That's I thought, well said, yeah. <laughs> because we were willing, I mean, even way before my council experiences, the council was willing to work with the owner. And we did make huge changes that allowed a lot of changes. And we thought they were right in sync with the owner. But the final thing was, it didn't work. There were too many players, like the land trust mm -hmm, and nonprofits. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just us and a private uh, property owner. There were a lot of other nonprofit organizations trying to put this patchwork quilt together, which is wonderful when it works, but it only takes one slippage, and suddenly somebody no longer sees it beneficial. Mm -hmm. Land is so precious in Montpelier. <laughs> you look on a map, we are such a small postage stamp of land. <clears throat> and you see it in a lot of what we discuss. It's, ah, wouldn't it be great to do this? But where would we put it? It could be, you know, yeah. a homeless warming station or something. It, it, there's a lack of options, you know. And, and having 100, 130 acres up there, you know, not only uh, is it a, a lot of potential to do housing, new neighborhood, uh, the other thing is we need a rec center, and if we're going to be forward thinking, the one on the one on Barry Street doesn't fit the bill. It's uh, but didn't we do a survey? We we allocated thirty thousand for a survey of that rec center, and what the survey came in saying that they wanted it within walking distance of downtown. That that was important to people because at the time there was some discussion of putting it up at the rec field on Elm Street. There was some mm -hmm. discussion of putting it on some of the land by the high school, which the high school wasn't thrilled about. Um, and people said, no, we would like a central location that we don't have to drive to. If I, if memory serves, now keep in mind that my wife and I are not the spry people that when we first came <laughs> to Montpelier, but that's a pretty good walk from central Montpelier along that trail up to that location at the Elks Club. How do people get there who don't have cars? Well, one, I would say people on surveys sometimes mark the box that's their ideal and not their behavior. That most people drive either themselves or their kids to the facility on Barry Street. The majority do not walk. And that I feel we can support public transit and make an easy connection, one that's needed anyways. And we can make it regional that helps us afford it. The cost was another one that came across in that survey, uh, that eight, 8 million to 15 million for a rec center was not where people were at in terms of building a facility. Mm. That was not, that was a It was a, a much concern. larger number than that. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. it was. What is the number that we have in mind right now for a recreation facility? Well, if, you're, if we're looking to 
And, and if it does fail on the ballot, you know, we might look at renovating the current rec center, but that's going to cost, when all is said and done, between seven and eight million dollars, right. you know. I was going to say seven. To, to, to me, you know, if we could, the building is a great location, but there's only so much space we could do on it. Um, as we look at affordable housing, it's an ideal candidate for that. And, and you know, walkable would be great. And if there was a patch of land downtown, yeah. I, I would be supporting that. But it, it also is, it depends on who you're talking about. If we put it out on Elm Street, you know, and you're a kid on Berlin Street, that's a long walk to like absolutely. bring your basketball, right? <laughs> you're, you're, uh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, on that question, how much are we talking? This is a future loaded plan. You know, you're buying the land right now, but to put something on that land goes from our capital budget, and we project, and again, capital budget is one of two budgets that we have. Don, would you explain capital budget versus <laughs> operating? <laughs> <laughs> well, op operating is your day-to-day. -day. Capital is like your mortgage at home. It's a long-term investment in a structure, in a building, in the utilities underground that you pay over time. And ca our existing capital budget is projected out over years in yes, terms of projects years. that we would like to see. And you can think of it as a queue, as one. Yep. Now, this, again. One, one gets done and paid off, and another one exactly. comes in. And another so one slots in. So we have in. standards of how much capital debtedness we can have. And so we keep, keep that in mind. So we have this sort of range that's allowed. And, and, and the the budgets, the bonds we have now keep us in that range. We get a little high for like two years, and then we're back. So right now, in this capital budget, we are asking for, uh, we're asking to purchase the land at, at the Elks. We're asking for a sum for Confluence Park. Would you explain what Confluence Park will be and when Confluence Park will be? Oh, the when might be a uh, difficult when? question. Uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know. See, whenever we talk about projects in Montpelier, the when is always the most difficult. Why do you think we keep running for council here? We've we got to see it through, Richard. Uh, push it through, push it through. Uh, but the Con Confluence Park's been in the works for a while. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people have come to the council and just raised their voices saying, this town wasn't necessarily built facing the river. You look at all the buildings along it, and it's all away from the river. But my goodness, we, it's such an asset that we have, you know. And, and you have some of these folks who come in with these great ideas, recreational opportunities. You know, let's look at these dams. And that's something we're actually looking at right now. We're looking at the legislature at a dam analysis to see, okay, we've got these three dams in town. Are Where they are actually the three dams in town? We've got the, uh, the, it's the Rat Dam, the Shaw's Dam, yeah. and then the one up by like Bare Naked Growler area there, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, if you talk to the River Conservancy, they, they, they would say, you know, those dams actually might be harmful and putting us in jeopardy of flooding. So we need yeah. to do an analysis of that. And if we can take those dams out, it opens it up to all sorts of recreational op opportunities, including nice park access down there. People would love to like just take their lunch during the day it's what you where, keep hearing is we, we need more park access. What can... part of, of the riverfront is Confluence Park? Oh, it, Confluence Park is where the North Branch Dog River comes down and hits Winooski. It's right behind the Shaws. So another way of putting this, I suppose, is I'm walking by the Shaws over the new walking bridge, and then I turn right towards the walking path. Is that... Junction. If you're walking from Shaw's, you turn left. To or see. turn left. You're absolutely that's exactly right. If I turn yep. right, I'm going into the parking lot. But that's Dog I, River you're walking over. Right. So basically, that area where we have picnic tables right now is envisioned to be Confluence Park? It is, yes. Yep. yep. And uh, I, I think there's still some discussion that is how far back it can go, that type of thing. But I called it Dog River. It's North Branch. It is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're fine. Just total slippage. <laughs> North See, Branch. I didn't catch it. <laughs> North Branch. And I was thinking, well, no, 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 no. Dog River is over the wreck field by the wastewater treatment right. plant. Okay, folks, sorry about that. It's North Branch that comes into it. So we're talking about where those picnic tables are right now. So this is Confluence yeah. concept. It's still. <laughs> it is a concept. And we're working with the River Conservatory. And the city's share is 600000 the, the nonprofit is coming up with 600000 I mean, this is a very expensive project, but it's going to be one of those other things that's like a legacy. It's like Hubbard Park. 
People invested when there was all sorts of open land. And they said, what are you doing this for? The future. And like, I mean, we can use Confluence Park as soon as it's done, but it should last. And it should, not only that, but it should create more Riverside Parks. It's uh, really the bike path has evolved into more than I think we ever could have expected it to be. So to keep building along the bike path, and I hate to go back to the Elks Club, but it does meet right there. But having the Confluence Park, when you think you can go almost by the railroad station to U32 by the time it's done, and to have all these assets along the way, it's a beautiful thing. Are we envisioning, now I'm not going into the weeds, I'm going into the water. <laughs> uh, are we envisioning the water going higher so that people can kayak or, or canoe in, in we, that river? We have to do the dam analysis first. Yeah. Um, but, but hopefully in the next couple of years we can get that done. With kayaking and yep. canoeing. And we're exploring opportunities at the legislature right now. So. so that is a major push forward project for the city. It's things you can do on the water. I asked Ann this question, I'll, so I know the answer and hopefully you guys uh -oh. do. And people who watched Ann She's very smart, I gotta say. <laughs> she said it, we'll say yes. <laughs> um, a tiff is called tax incremental financing. Yes. And a TIF allows us to finance things such as the infrastructure uh, under, the, under the road now yep. that yep. helped us to land the distillery over on Berry Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. It would have helped us to construct a parking garage had that happened. Yes. Are we envisioning the TIF continuing east all the way over to the Elks Club? Well, the TIF has a set territory when we apply. I'm not saying we can't make an amendment of that. Are, are we thinking yeah. an amendment? Because there it, has to be it, infrastructure It, it doesn't there. currently, I don't believe, right? No, it doesn't. But no, I, I, does I think not. we could make an amendment for it. I mean, and, and yeah, Bar Hill is a good example. That whole area of town, I think, is, you know, primed to build up. Um, right. So, yeah, no, it, it's a good thought. Because likewise, when I see if indeed that elk club land was developed, both for housing and recreation, then I would see Saban Pasture more likely to find some alternatives that mm -hmm. will really happen mm -hmm. more quickly because it is that development of another part of town. Uh, again, it's very difficult in Montpelier. It's like nailing jello to the wall. How many <laughs> houses are we thinking on that 130 acres might be conceivable? Oh, you, you see, I think we, part of this is uh, <coughs> the community discussion which would, takes, would, which would really on take and place. On and on and yeah, they want uh, answers uh, before you. Can, after, yeah. yeah, we don't want to answer it too much. I guess for me, I really look at dense housing, not housing sprawled over the hillside. Um, no, I'm but, talking about the Elks Club. But the Elks Club, I see right. dense housing there. Um, and maybe at least some of it. But who knows? That's the public discussion. So we don't want to nail it down before we get the land. Once we have the land, then we can start the discussion. And if nothing works out, we can sell it. And we can take an in incremental approach on this, yes. which I really like with that, with that amount yes. of land. You know, it's, uh, you know, when we're asking how much we want to put into it, it could be a pretty modest rec center built with room for expansion at the end. You know, there, there, there were uh, folks who came in, and I'm not saying this is even on the table right now, but it's a possibility, the yeah. jump and splash folks who want swimming facilities. Swimming pools. So there's swimming, two swimming pools in that proposal. You know, it was cost prohibitive at some of the places we were looking. But over time, maybe some financiers come to the table. Maybe that's an option. You know, I'm not saying it is, but at, at least we have options then, you know. What else is in the capital budget that... Um is a noteworthy project. Oh, the wastewater recovery facility. Our energy Yes, efficiency. that's that phase two. Mm -hmm. So it gets not only more efficient, but it also deals with right now. Phase one did a tremendous job of taking, I'm gonna call waste, burning it to create energy, and also reducing- Finding value. Also reducing truckloads that we had to carry sludge away, because we're now taking care of it. But the next phase is also a further leather, level of reducing toxics being given out that now give us odor, which is terrible for that part of town, just terrible. If I understand correctly, and of course I do, <laughs> um, there's also another building that's planned to be heated by the byproduct of the waste treatment plant. We, we oh, yes. use that methane to sit and heat those facilities mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. are proximate to it instead of yes. having them heated in a conventional manner. And I understand that they're planning another building. 
Well, yes, it's not just the what's there now, we are, but we also ultimately will gain revenue. So it'll be not only taking care of its energy needs, but giving us revenue to apply elsewhere. It's really like, uh, it's a part of city government that I think we take for granted, left and right, but you know, important to give credit to the, the four employees who work there. We just won a huge national award on this, you know. It, it's really innovative thinking here, um, and the commitment they have, you know, as we were looking, even at COVID, it's like, what if city employees go out? What would we have done if like our four wastewater treatment employees went out there, you know? Yep. So that's the type of stuff you have to consider. But uh, it, it really, as far as, you know, our commitment to environmental justice, you know, uh, the investments in this wastewater treatment plant are, you know, really already paying dividends, I think, with what we're getting out of it. What about the water treatment plant on the hill? Is, you is, mean the drinking water? Exactly. Is there drinking. anything? Wastewater, drinking water. Right. Is there anything coming up on that one? Any, any required changes? Well, not right now. We went through some, and that's another one. Both of these plants are so high tech. It's awesome. And when the public once in a while gets a chance to come in and tour them, do it. It's fascinating. Just fascinating. Yep. We, we have talked about maybe having like city days where members of the public yes. can go into some of these facilities and really see how they work. Because then you really know when you turn on the water what it took. <laughs> my, my eyes were popping out of my head on that, you know. It's and really... they make it interesting. They do. It's... Yeah. What's yeah. the status of uh, the wood chip project? We, we take that wood one for chip, granted. Wood chip, the pellets? Yep. The uh, wood chip firing plant um, over next to um, the transit center. The, the underground pellets. heat. Yes, the mm -hmm. district heat. Right. What's going on with that? Not enough. And we would hope to have uh, more partners. But I have to just back up. This, to me, is a good time to say... In 2020, March 2020, when we saw very clearly just how quick in December, January, and February before the pandemic was declared, how much revenue we were losing, we started cutting and we lost staff, we put people on furlough, we stopped projects. We did the same in 2021 and leading into 22 budget. So this year, we're able to start putting things back on the table that we have the revenue to cover. And we're not being outlandish, we're just replacing what we lost. What would an example of that be? Uh, staffing, uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to replace people who had left. We didn't refill those places. Even when people came back from furlough, we have uh, energy uh, personnel that really needs to be. We need someone who's looking at all of our buildings for maintenance and energy improvements. Is that the new staff position? It yes. Is, uh, we, yes. Uh, we, we hope, you know, like many things, it's hopefully a smart investment to the future where that position can actually pay for itself. It's... But even if it's not, it's taking us to our sustainable goals. We put these goals out there, and as city council members, every week we talk about them. They're on all, mm -hmm. every single agenda item has a sheet on it that says, what goal does this relate to? What cost does it relate to? And I, and I wish people would pay more attention to those that are attached to the agenda, because they really tell you the thoughtfulness of those projects. The energy audit that's required before you sell your house, mm -hmm. there was a lot of resistance to that. That's a non-monetary, right? If yes. Cinder and I were to leave this town, that would be free to us prior to selling our home. We wouldn't have to pay anything to do that, yes? Right. That, that's correct. There's a, there's a tool online you can go on, and mm -hmm. anybody can find out uh, that right now. It, it really, we, we talked about how few homes are sold in Montpelier a year, about 100. 80% of them do that already. Uh, so it, it's a pretty small number of people we're talking about. But I think it, like, it's an important conversation starter. It's important for people to get in that mindset, you know, as they're buying a house to, to think what they can do. Um, and, you know, like, like Donna said, we had strong community commitment to the 2050 net zero goal there. Mm. Um, and I, I think unless we're making steps towards that progress, it's not worth the paper it's written on some of these goals. It's... One more in the capital budget before we go into operating. Barry and Main. That's in the capital budget. It was one of those projects that got pushed aside when mm. revenue started slipping through the pandemic. Yes. Would you explain a couple of things? One, this is going to be a traffic light that's 25 feet away from another traffic light. Uh, what was the thinking between that and a, um, a circle, a little mini circle? 
I'd have to go back. I, I, I thought at the end of the day, the analysis showed that the circle would have been too tight. Uh, although I, I'd be a big proponent of them generally. <laughs> yeah, I lost that fight. I'm, I'm a roundabout person. I was there for the first one on Maine and um, spring. I mean, I, I think I've been in Europe, all sorts of small roundabouts. But the roundabout at Maine and Barrie not only was small, but it had the railroads. And the railroad was the real yeah, final. Right. Right. And I'll tell you, Tom <laughs> McCardle, who was head former, of former. Yeah, former head of D DPW, sat there in front of city council. And he, he looked at me because he knew I wanted a roundabout. And he said, Donna, this is because because I, in order to do a roundabout well, you have to have the joining intersections roundabout. So you're talking about putting a roundabout <coughs> on Main two, and River. No, on River and Main. Memorial. And then yeah. have a traffic light over on Berry Street. What Scotch to Main? Well, well, no, they all would be roundabouts. You, right. you start at Spring Street, coming all the way down to Memorial, and they'd all be roundabouts. And Tom went through the money, and he's <laughs> and I said, okay, I yield. We are going to go to traffic lights. So if we're going to go to traffic lights. Now we're going to do the smart traffic lights so that they react to one another. So they're not on the same timer, they're in re relationship to one another and the traffic at one another. So if there's no one who's trying to turn south or north on Main Street from Barrie, going out or up, then that light will remain dormant. That's my understanding. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty yep. uh, interesting technology. Yes, and it is expensive technology, but it really makes mm. sense instead of having these jam-ups because you have every light timed a certain way. And then the light at State and Main will adjust accordingly. Yeah, all four lights. Right, all four lights. Is there any discussion, again, of the, round, the mini roundabout by the library? Because that's another one that, that people have talked about. No, it, it, see, the main and... Because it's difficult to get out of school well, street. Main and uh, Berry Street had its own scoping study. So there is still one sitting there for a demo. What the group decided through that study was they wanted a roundabout by the library, but they wanted to do a demo first and make sure that it worked for people and pedestrians. Because the concern about roundabouts with a lot of traffic is it may not give pedestrians enough protections, especially those who are visually impaired. Or children. Children. Well, yeah, for children, actually, I find roundabouts safer because it allows you to go one part mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. roadway, wait, and then the other part of the roadway. But that would be a demo. But that was part. I mean, the whole Main and Berry Street had a lot of components. The one we've carried forward, we're waiting for the other ones for the next <laughs> round of revenue is the traffic light because the traffic light would then affect everything along the way. The master downtown plan um, was going through and then all of a sudden you know the world shut down for several years mm -hmm. and also there aren't as many people in offices downtown you know projected forward and the like. Is that master plan that included both the library as well as um, Barry and Maine is that master plan going to be rethought through? Now you're talking about the downtown yeah, the master downtown plan. Yeah, the downtown master plan. A lot, lot of different components here because you have the city <laughs> We have plan. a lot of master plans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and certainly, I think when, whether it's a year out, two years out, it'll need to be re-looked at. It's a, it's a Things good, change. It's a good point, Richard. You know, like you, you go downtown and it's getting better, I think. But it was tumbleweeds for a while. So, you know, again, like I said, uh, we swell up to like, you know, 20 some thousand, that hasn't been the case, right? And we're following very closely um, at the state level to see how many of these state employees really are coming back. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, maybe they haven't seen producti productivity drop in some of these departments. A lot of people like working at home and that's a major blow to our downtown businesses. It really is. <laughs> what about the Rialto Bridge? Uh, the bridge across on State Street. Uh, there was talk that that would be re refurbished in several years. Is that on schedule? Yes. Um, it's actually connected to the work on East State Street because we couldn't do the bridge until we dealt with the underground utilities at the main and East State Street entrance. And so one of the bonds is for East State Street and all the underground utilities. Are we concerned that we're playing whack-a-mole on sewers? That mm. as sewers and water pipes <laughs> bust, you see them rush over you know, and, and do spot patch work, and our sewer system is ancient. In some cases, 
I think on Berry Street they said it was wooden. You know, was... Yeah, but what people don't seem to want to own up is as much as we've said, the ones that have bursted over the winters have been the younger pipes because they have not lived up to their profile when they were bought at the time. So we. When, what does younger mean in this context? It means context? that they're actually some sort of, I'm going to say, Plastic, but I, that's a big word. Is this uh, younger the, being the last 50 years? Yes. Last 20 yes. Years? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So, and you can never, and that's climate change, folks. That's where we're back to net zero. It's climate change. The constant range of temperature, with the freezing, thawing is very, very hard for pavement. I mean, we, we live in a town shaped like a starfish with five hills here where the temperature regularly drops below zero and we've got the rivers converging. So just like you're saying, it's climate change can impact Montpelier at a disproportionate level, I think, than the rest of the state of the country even. It's... I mean, even this winter, I mean, they're just, I mean, I'm driving over here, there were probably 12 sections that were at least a yard wide, maybe a foot thick, that was just hollowed out. The asphalt just crumbled. The rest of the row was fine, but there was this, uh, it's we, the weather. I know that when John Holler was mayor, one of his pledges that he came through with was to put together a fund that would be allocated to road repair every yes. year. Yes, I steady think, state. Right, didn't we skip that during the pandemic? The pandemic? And so we mm -hmm. re, re, re we reinstituted it. So yes. that's back in the budget. And yes. we're making yes. substantial investments in roads. But we Listen. not only didn't put the money in the steady state, but we didn't have the personnel to go out and do the work. People don't realize how much our DPW does the work on the street, and we didn't have them there to do it. It's been tough. And as we get some of this ARPA money to replenish okay, that. Stop. Oh, yep. That's the acronym alert. What is our <laughs> Oh, okay. American Recovery. Re rescue. Re rescue and... Uh, Wow, that's awful, isn't it? Yeah. American and that, Rescue Plan Act. I and think that goes yeah, into yeah. the operating side or the capital side? Capital. Okay. Yep, and what we can do is recoup some of what we've lost in revenue, which the parking meters alone, oh, it was astronomical what we lost. Yeah, million. Let's go into operating. And the operating side is what... Well, can I... I want to go back just a little bit, sure. Richard, because I really... All during that time, the past two and a half years, when we're cutting things down, constantly hearing from people, roads, 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 and not accepting why it wasn't happening. Now we have bonds out there trying to recover that. And, and these bonds represent really a small part of how much money we're applying to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I brought pages here, just in case you have questions, <laughs> of all the projects, roadways, that we, we, over a million that we just, projects, we just stopped. So I want people to really realize that the bonds are there because we were responsible. We didn't have a deficit the last two and a half years, but there was a lot of work that didn't get done. Montpelier as a city is not static. It has constant needs. Well, let's stay on bonds then. <laughs> if we were to build a $15 million rec center, and I'm drawing that out of my hat. Let's okay. just say, that, yeah. what are we pushing off that's, $15 million big that's been in the planning for a decade. Uh, we're going to defer something because this hasn't mm -hmm. been in the planning for a decade. It's something new. What types of projects would we have to put off in order to put something really significant in their place? Well, we actually had in the, the bond projection vision that, that's the 20-year plan you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We had uh, about six to eight million for the rec center. Okay, so re we start by, by that's one project mm -hmm. that we do have budgeted right. in and, that vision. And likewise, we're looking at revenue we're going to get when we do all the f pay phase two of the water recovery facility so that we see some revenue actually coming in, not just capital money going out. So it's not necessarily that you drop something, but you look at your whole 20 year scope and what's falling off and what you can put on. To me, the rec center has to be a priority. You know, you go outside, we're living in a place that snow is on the ground six, seven months a year sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic has taken a tremendous, uh, I, I think, mental health toll on some of our children in this community and just having that outlet to go there you know, play pickleball, play a game of pickup basketball or something in these like hard winter months, especially when you're isolated. Yeah, it's worth its weight in gold. I really believe that. 
and the child care. People forget that through our rec department, we offer city child care, and we have many more demands than we have space for. And that would be another thing that I feel is really, really understated in having the bigger rec place. In Let's the go to operating, because that's, <laughs> that, that's All right. as we run through this. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll go line by line, and we'll have this show two hours long while you discuss <laughs> line by line. The capital episode? The capital budget. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, how many, the operating assumption on this budget is that it's at a 7% inflation rate. Does the city assume that people's wages have risen 7% in the last year? Well, costs it's, I, I think you have to divide it, what's going to be reflected in your tax bill, too. Um, and that's, with the schools coupled with it, you're looking at one point. But two. the schools are reducing simply because we're coming off of a different agreement that we had earlier, yes. which is cutting our school. I'm talking about the city side of the budget. Okay, but the the schools came yes. in at 4.5% mm -hmm. as their increase. The city is coming in at 7%. Yes, because we're restoring. But at the same time, but, as you said, we weren't getting the same services last year that we had because personnel was laid off, and now we're coming back accounting for last year. So we're going to work the staff hard. But the thing that I find amazing is every year that I've been on council working to stay under 2% increase, 2 3% increase, and the school budget, whoa! So everybody was so, uh, you know, reacting to the total number, I thought they never gave the city credit for how low we kept our operating money. And this year, we're up. We're up to make up for the last two and a half years. It won't continue that way. We now have recovered. What does next year's budget look like? Can we go down again? Down again. To a 3 4% increase? Uh, well, yes. I, yeah, yes. I think yes. we'll be lower than yes. yeah. But it is yes. important to, like you said, we 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 flatlined it last year. You know, yeah, to give people and, a break because we knew it was in the pandemic. The <laughs> <laughs> or the years we reduced. But I, I, I fundamentally don't think you can cut yourself out of a economic downturn here. What we're putting in are investments for the future, whether it be the energy coordinator, some of these other items. And again, as we said in the beginning, looking into the future where we can increase housing stock and hopefully make this a more affordable city, because we're not, we're not on that track right now, but a couple of cuts isn't going to do it. I, I think that's, you know, people have to get that in their heads there. That's yeah, because I, I mean, I wish I had the percentage and I was going to actually go look at the chart in the budget. Our finance operator gives us these charts, but we're like 80, almost as high as a school in personnel cost. We're about service. Our cost is about people. As it's always been. As it's always been. So you can't just, you know, whack them away and still give the services because people want the services. The police department. How many police are we down to at this point? I, I know oh. we normally like to staff at about 17. We, we've had a couple come on lately, but we've had a couple go off lately, yeah. too. So I think, I think you'd have to ask the chief, but I... I think we're one or two down. Um, yeah, or more. We were a lot yeah. more than one or two yeah, down. Yeah, I would say more like we two were, or three. Yeah, we were down at 13, 14 right, for right. a while there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that a and, concern? Well, it is a concern, but it's a national concern. Right. It's, it's like, a tough job. It's, well, it's a tough job, and it's always been difficult. But it, even before the pandemic, it was getting hard. And we, after the pandemic and during it, it's been much, much harder. Now, you know, we're returning back to the capital budget. We keep coming back. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. You did it then. <laughs> uh, we have body cams yep. coming in. Would you explain that policy and the need for body cams? Sure. I, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, no matter who you look at, I was even reading an ACLU study on it. Uh, the more transparency, the better, whether you're the officer, whether you're the person uh, in any sort of interaction there. And we've been able to get it down so it's, it's actually on a cell phone yeah. rather than this really yeah. expensive equipment that would have broken the bank in the past here. Um, so with the storage, you know, the, the, I think it was going to break the bank on the storage component of it's it. Terrible. Uh, it's the terrible. technology's come a long way. Chief Pete's brought a lot to the table. So I think we really are moving into the 21st century, hopefully, with body cams. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's rare. It's rare. Uh, but in a case where it's, you know, they said versus they said, the body camera, you, you know, often does a, a good deal of good. I, I'll tell you, I'm glad that, that Connor's here because I've been opposed to the body camera. I feel it just puts an attitude out there 
and the wrong focus. I want to see us building relationships. And the How does the body cam do that when I've got a cell phone that I could point uh, at the interaction myself? Well, the, the body cam is out there, I feel, because we are hearing from young people who are taking, I feel, the national mindset, and we need to change that. And if the body cam will help people see what's really happening, both for the police and for any citizen, then we can do it through the phones. But the previous body cameras were so expensive, and the storage so expensive, I didn't feel it was worth the investment. But this now, has changed. Now you have not only the body cam, but uh, I understood that um, the data transparency issue was way expensive to yes. be able right, to slice right. and dice that little data that we can generate in the village of 7,500. Was that the case? Yes, yes, well, yes. It, <laughs> it is. But, I, you know, I, I think all of this um, moves towards more trans. I, I really want to hand it to Chief Pete, you know, whether it be restoring coffee with a cop, which we just brought back, you know, to having this community engagement officer, which is a new position in the budget. Um, I, I, I think our department is very responsive to the national picture here. Um, you know, they, they are just as disgusted, some of these officers you talk to, as anybody else with some of these, like, atrocities that are happening across our country. Yeah. Um, and Chief, Chief Pete seems like somebody who would hold his own department to a higher standard. But Tony did as well. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Tony Pecos, the former yeah, chief. And, and, and Brian is continuing that. Right. And, and there's something written into the budget uh, for another social worker, if, if yes. I remember correctly. Or more hours. Right. In, in the last budgets, uh, a social worker was budgeted in along with Barry. You know, uh, and the thinking, if I can interpret the thinking, was that a lot of police issues deal with a skill set that really is beyond the training of police. Yes, mental health. Absolutely. You really need mental health experts. And that we're going in that direction, we're investing more in that direction. Yes, and this is always a slippery slope because as we get involved more with mental health and social issues, which are needed, it's hard to balance between what's the city's responsibility and what's the state's responsibility. And we feel the state has really dropped the ball on some of this stuff, you know. Um, yep. Caring for this population, we put 80-some 80, 80 thousand in recently just to make sure people aren't freezing on our streets, that they have a hotel voucher when the state isn't there to give them one. Um, so it, it's an investment, but is it an investment the city should be making or does the state need to step up? I really think they do. In terms of our addressing the homelessness, uh, the structure next to the art store in Shaw's. What was the thinking behind moving something that was away from the public site, still somewhat close, it was 100 yards away or something on that level, up to our commercial downtown? It was at a very tight intersection on the bike path there um, where you would have a lot of kids coming from school. Uh, and there'd be some interactions there, but you know, we, we don't want to, you know, this is a population that's often discriminated against, and we don't want to push them into the shadows, you know. It's, um, it, it is a structure that, you know, everybody should be able to use. And they're, but, but everybody isn't using it. It's not being used by families. Right, but anybody has a right to. Well, come on. They do, they come do. On, Connor. Uh, and I, 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 to tell you, I go up there every, every week or so and talk to the population that's there and hear about some of the issues. You're homeless, not just because of some of the factors that people think about. I think it's painted with a broad brush. Mm -hmm. These are folks who are like victims of domestic violence in some cases, folks who have really been lost by the system, you know, with severe substance abuse issues, acute mental health issues. And of course, we're not equipped to handle that as a city, but we have to be compassionate and not just push them out, you know. It's... Right, and the city council didn't move that shelter of its own, I would say, own motivation we heard from citizens who really wanted to be able to use the bike path and not have that confrontation. But by moving it out to a park, which we hope then to do more with, we're hoping that eventually these individuals who are without a home right now can be integrated and share that shelter. Do you we see all tent camping it. on that uh, facility? But they're not, by, by and large, they're not sleeping there. But they are spending their but daytime. But when the weather there. becomes conducive, do you see homeless tent encampment on that site? Well, tent, tent, tenting? Yeah, 
uh, as they have in other if cities. We're, if we're going to the coast. encampment policy, the, the, the policy states, you know, if there's no shelters to go to, yep. public land can be used for camping. Except for parkland, which is ruled by the Park Commission. And that, so that, that is city that's land that the city to... controls. Well, actually, um, the, it's still city property. It doesn't matter who governs it. It's city property. So legally, the park can be camped on. If we can't offer them a shelter somewhere else. Does the Park Commission agree with that? No, they mean that they... No, they have oversight in the charter. But the, the law of the land has oversight of whatever we have in our ordinances. And the courts have said they have the right. Certainly, you can go to court. We can have well, a Well, let's talk battle, about a positive. We're constructing, <laughs> we're constructing beds for those people down on 302 over in the Twin Cities. So that in yep. theory, we are alleviating the need for sleeping out in the public because we are offering additional space for people who don't have beds to sleep in. So we are affirmative in that. That's the positive way of looking at it. Right, but we really need the heavy state partnership so that when people first start sl sliding into their cars and out of their house, they get help as soon as possible. Because as once they become really unhoused, and a lot of them uncarred, mm -hmm. they really have such stress of just living day to day, it's harder and harder to provide the services that they need and for them to use the services that they need. And we do provide money to community organizations through our community fund I, I, that address not this. Enough, not I, enough. I really want to hand it to another way and That's Good Samaritan who, who have good stepped Samaritan. up um, stepped up when nobody else wants to um, and they've been at the Homelessness Task Force. They serve on the Homelessness Task Force in some cases and, and you know we, we, we've seen some real positive results and to Twin City as you said we hope it puts a real dent in the population there because nobody should have to be that, sleeping on the streets. And they have enough land there to expand. See, and hopefully it will. You and know, and, and we they'll are have making... a hub of services. Yeah. So, so within that facility, it's not just beds and housing, but it's also services will be there. And we're picking up the social worker working with the police so that we can steer towards that. I mean, we have yeah, an organized yeah. plan. It's, it's sure, not as if sure. we we're did... rushing to put people in the parks sleeping. We, we just don't have the resources. That's the problem. It's... Well, the problem is bigger than the city can handle alone. It is. So it's, a, just, it's a regional problem. Are, are we addressing just... it regionally, Connor? Is Barry involved with the planning on this? Actually, Barry just, just established a homelessness task force uh, along with ourselves. So there is some coordination. We invested in a countywide study. We just gave uh, 15000 dollars I believe to the countywide study looking at the root causes of this and how we can work better with the cities it's um because you know it's a lot of folks are going back and forth between Barry Berlin and Montpelier we need to we need to treat it that way yeah. well I want to thank you for coming and discussing this for those of you who have a further interest Donna is going to read from the capital budget for two hours <laughs> a, dr a dramatic reading <laughs> a dramatic reading for the capital budget um, I want to thank you for watching the show and I'd urge you to Vote. And that doesn't mean coming out on town meeting day. It means either returning that ballot early or coming out on town meeting day. And um, engage yourself. Make sure that you're civically involved. Uh, when is the city council coming live again? You, can you show up in the chamber? I don't know. We, our next meeting is remote. It's next week. Can we determine? Yeah. Okay, so what next about week the mask we'll talk policy? About the future. What's going on with the mask policy in the town? It's the 11th, isn't it, when it will be reconsidered? Yep. 11th yep. of March? So we we yep. reconsider that every 45 days uh, yep. for the governor's order. So it's possible that the schools won't have masks and the city will. It's possible. It's possible. At that, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>